Welcome to the OCC Podcast. Whether you're listening to this at home, on the road, at work, or in the gym, we're so glad you decided to join us as we study God's Word together. We hope and pray that through this ministry, you will grow in your relationship with God as well as become a chair for disciple maker. But for now, sit back and let us help you see how the Bible applies to your life today. Hey guys. Uh, so glad you guys can make it in to church today. Just want you guys to know I do know how to turn on stuff and plug things in. It was for the skit. So, uh, My name is Brenton. I'm the worship pastor here. We are in week two of our Plugged In series. And just like the video showed, TVs, lamps, microwaves, things like that, they don't work properly unless they are plugged in. As wonderful as they are with all their internal components and complexities, they're designed to be plugged in. You can't use them the way they were designed unless they're plugged into their source of power. And so for the, in their cases, it's the electrical grid, right? They need electricity to function according to their purpose. For us, in our case, we need to be plugged in to God. We as his creations are designed to be plugged in to him. For he is the source of power, he's the source of life itself. Now last week, James walked us through the first half of Acts 8, and he introduced us to a character named Simon the Magician. And if you listen to Midpoint this week, I hope you did, you might have heard that today is actually part two of that series, of that study. And that's why I've titled this sermon, A Belief That Does. Like James's message was, was titled, A Belief That Doesn't Save. And that message, which you can, you can listen again on our YouTube page or you can go on our podcast, uh, Church Center app. If you missed it, I would encourage you to go listen to it. It's a really good message. But what he did was he showed us that just because you profess to be a believer, that doesn't mean that you're saved. Okay, look at James, two, James chapter 2, verses 14 and 17. It says, What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. So a person could potentially say that they have faith, have all the right answers, look Christian, even wear you know, the Christian jersey, put the, the he is greater than I sticker on their, on their car, and yet their life, their actions, their deeds, their thoughts, and their heart do not know him. And so what the Bible says is, no, that faith cannot save you because it is a dead faith. And so in Acts 8, we saw that Simon, he, he did all the right things. He said all those, those things. You know, He even went so, so far as to get baptized. And, and he joined Philip in his ministry. And so by all accounts, everybody could say, well, you know, Philip was part of the ministry. He, he joined it. But in the end, his heart was unchanged because he was rebuked by the apostle Peter. And, and as Pastor James said, you know, we can't know this for sure, but from what we can tell from scripture, it seems that Simon's conversion was not genuine. And so today in part two of our study, we're going to be introduced to another character. This man has no name. We only know him by his, his job and, and title and position. And where Simon's interaction ended with, with uh, him and, sorry, where Simon's interaction with Philip ended with him being rebuked, this man's interaction with Philip goes a lot differently. And, and we're going to see from this narrative that he was truly changed. His faith was not dead. And I think Luke does this on purpose. I think he intentionally puts these two stories back to back. Because honestly, we don't know how much time passed between Simon the Magician and the Ethiopian. Could have been a few days, a few weeks, or even months. But Luke decides to sandwich these two together for us to compare the two. Okay, he, he did this a lot in his gospel. He put parables or stories right after one another so that we would see what not to do and then we would see what to do. Or we'd see a bad reaction to the gospel and then a good response to the gospel. And so as we walk through this chapter and talk about the Ethiopian eunuch, I want you to predominantly keep Simon in the back of your mind just for comparative purposes. Okay, but I also want you to keep an eye on Philip. Okay, because Philip, even though he's a side character in his own story, uh, he's such a great example of obedience and walking in faith. So j just see how when God tells him to go, he goes. There, there's, there's no hesitation whatsoever. And so I know it's a lot, but I, I want to try to challenge you to do two things at once, okay? Number one, again, keep Simon's story in the back of your head. We're going to go through you know, the passage back and forth, so you guys should be able to keep it fresh. But then number two, notice how ob obedient Philip 
is, in which as you do, you might feel God's nudge in your heart today to obey God with this relentless yes. And so let his reactions and his responses be your guide as God is nudging you that way. And, and as always, I always like to, to pray before. Uh, so bow your heads with me so we can pray for our time today. Father God, thank you so much for this story. Thank you for your word. God, thank you for this opportunity to study, to just sit um, and be in your presence. Um, God, we're, we're all here students uh, who want to know you better, including myself. Um, and so God, I pray that you would illuminate your word for us. God, that you would be seen, that you would be glorified. Um, God, that we would see you more clearly. And God, that we would... Um, look like your son more and more each day. For our good and your glory, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. If you would, open up your Bibles and turn to Acts 8, and we're going to be starting in verse 26. So as you're turning there, I mean, it's going to be on your screen, but as you're turning there, I want to show you a map of where we're kind of talking about. Okay. If you remember last week, Philip was in Samaria. That's at the top of the red line all the way up there. Okay, and, and while he's there, he's preaching to the crowds, right? And that's where he meets Simon the magician and he, he baptizes everybody and then the apostles show up and then you know, they do the laying on of hands thing. And then he and Peter and John all leave Samaria and then they travel to Jerusalem, okay? And, and that is 42 miles south of their position. And Luke says that at every city along the way, they continued to, to preach the gospel. Okay, so they're doing that, they're, they're making this journey, and, and they finally arrive at Jerusalem, they unpack their suitcases, and then they continue on with their ministry in Jerusalem, and so that's where we're going to pick it up in our passage today. Okay, verse 26. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And he rose and went. So Philip doesn't even, you know, seemed to be back in Jerusalem for very long, and the phone rings, and it's God. He didn't really have a phone. That's kind of a joke. Um, but, but the phone rings, and, and God says to Philip, hey, I need you to go to Gaza, which, if we bring up that map again, okay, Gaza is now 50 miles in the other direction, okay? And, and this is just weird to me, because look at what he's told to do. God doesn't say, go to this place, and then wait for a man in a black hat, or, you know, if you stand by this tree, you're going to get a man with an envelope and that's going to be everything that, you're, you know, your mission is going to be in there. Like the instructions are much less descriptive, right? It says, go to this huge stretch of road, which is in the desert, and just wait. Just be there. It's pretty vague, right? Like, can you imagine getting this call from God? Like your phone rings and you're like, hello. And he's like, hey, it's God. I need you to drive on Highway 12. And you're like, okay, awesome. Let's, let's do it. W what am I looking for? What do I need to do? Hello? Like, Hello? Like we would, we would be calling that number back in a hurry because it's like, God, I need more answers. I, I, you can't leave me like this. Now this would freak me out whenever I drive somewhere. I, I need to have directions. I need to know where I'm going. Um, and, and so it makes me uncomfortable. And so again, I have to say kudos to Philip because I would not to want to rose and went anywhere. Right, until God clarified some details for me. But, but really, that's the right response here. Okay, we need to follow Philip, Philip's example here, not mine. We need to be risers and winters rather than sitters and stayers. Does that make sense? The other thing I'd say is this. If you ever feel like God has set you on a path with no clear instructions, it, it seems like you're not alone. Apparently, sometimes this is just what God does. And so just do what Philip did, obey, and keep your eyes and ears open. So continuing on, verse 27. And there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. He'd come to Jerusalem to worship. Okay, so now we're introduced to the main character in our study. This man has no name. Again, keeping with last week's message in mind, we know Simon's name, right? His name is? Thank you, good job. Uh, but this guy doesn't have a name. And, and I was kind of thinking through, why, why do I think that is? And, and I think it, it, it is because we can easily identify with him. Like he could be any one of us. Thus, his name is not as important as what he does and how he acts. But, but what do we know of this guy? Well, we know he's an Ethiopian, right? So he's from a region in Northeast Africa. 
which means that the gospel is actually now starting to spread even further and further outward. And that's what God said in Acts 1.8, right? He said that he would um, share the, or spread the gospel to Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria, which was last week, and then to the ends of the earth, right? So God is doing that. God is moving. The, the gospel is spreading. We also know that this guy is a eunuch, which means that he's been castrated and sterilized. And that's all I'm going to say on the subject. If you really don't still know what I'm talking about, talk to your mom, okay? She'll explain it to you. But because of his condition, he was able to be an officer of the queen because he could now be trusted to not be fraternizing or flirting with any of the ladies. And, and we also know that he is a, uh, a court official of Candace, okay? Now, Candace, just so you know, it's not a name. Um, it's a title, okay? It's like Pharaoh or Caesar, and he's in charge of the treasure, which I think means that he's pretty high up in this study, okay? Uh, so he's a royal officer and ambassador. And the last thing we know is that he went to Jerusalem to worship. And for a man of his deformity, that's actually saying a lot about who he is. You see, Jews looked down on men like this because he was considered to be half a man. Like in Leviticus, it says that if you have been castrated, uh, you're not able to be a priest. Deuteronomy says that if, if you are like this, if you are deformed or you've been, yes, then you cannot assemble with the Israelites. Okay, so, so this man cannot go to Jerusalem and, and be seen at, or not be seen as a lesser, but he still goes, right? And that says a lot about his character. Now let's compare that with our study from last week, right? Simon was a Samaritan who again also was this half man type of thing. That's how he was seen because genetically he was half blood, half Jewish and half Gentile. And so we can see that both of these men kind of start their stories in similar positions, right? In your notes, it's it said this way, Simon and the Ethiopian are both outsiders, okay? They're both outside of God's favor. Neither one of them should really be talked about in God's holy Bible because really they don't deserve it, right? They were born into the wrong family or they have this, this surgery or, or th what they've done to themselves. Either way, you know, either way, you're not, you're not supposed to include them, but if I'm honest, that sounds a lot like who I am. Like, I don't deserve God's grace. I, I don't deserve God to be smiling down upon me. I, I wasn't born in the right family. I don't always do the right things. I don't say the right words. And yet, here I am. And, and, and so these guys are, find themselves in this position. They, they should not be receiving this good news from the apostle because that was only for the chosen people. And yet, here we are. Okay, verse 28. So this Ethiopian royal official of the queen was returning from Jerusalem, seated in his chariot, and he was reading the prophet Isaiah. Now, when we first met Simon, going back to earlier in eight, what was he doing? Does anybody remember? He was practicing sorcery. Let's look at verse nine. But there was a man named Simon who had previously practiced magic in the city and amazed the people of Samaria, saying that he himself was somebody great. So again, Simon is introduced as this sorcerer and, and he's quite prideful, totally full of himself. And not only that, but he's probably because of what he does, because of his line of profession, he's, he's highly acclaimed by the people and he's well known and probably in the least bit respected or feared, right? Because he was called the power of God that is called great. That was the title that they gave him. All right, now we're gonna contrast that with this Ethiopian. He is also well-respected but not because of what he could do or perform, but because of his position and title, right? And when we meet him, he's not conning people or he's not trying to you know, make himself great. He's studying the scriptures. He's actively looking for truth and trying to find wisdom. Now, I want you to keep that in mind because this is who they were pre-gospel message, right? They're both outcasts and outside of God's people, but they're, they're living two different lives, Right? They're, they're on two different sides of the spectrum, and that's important because of what it teaches us. Like God's message should and does go out to all different people of all different walks of life. Like Luke is showing us that, yes, Jesus is for the Jews in Jerusalem, but, but Jesus is also for the wealthy and also for the poor, also for the sick and the healthy or the broken. 
And now that message of Christ seems to be going even further and further and salvation through Jesus is now falling on the ears of, of those heathens in Samaria, right? And now these royal officials who've been mutilated. So we see that Jesus does not discriminate. The message of Christ isn't just for a certain type of person or a group of people, it's for everybody. No matter where you're born or what you've done to your body or what color your skin is or what religious background you have, the good news of Jesus dying on a cross for the forgiveness of sins is for everybody. Amen? Amen. All right, let's keep reading. <clears throat> Verse 29. And the spirit said to Philip, go over and join this chariot. And it's like, finally, right? He has like the instructions that he's been waiting for. Like he's been standing on the side of the road with his thumb out, I'd assume. But now he knows where to go, right? Right? Verse 30, so Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet, and he asked, do you understand what you are reading? And he said, how can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now, just think about this. Philip is a smart guy, right? He's plugged in to the power of God. And so I would think that he at least has an idea of who he's talking to, right? Like I'd imagine him standing on the side of the road, and he sees this convoy of Egyptians rolling by. And then God's like, hey, you see that guy? I want you to talk to him. And, and again, we, we could just do a case study of the amazing obedience and the relentless yes of Philip because he just goes and does, right? He has this faith that just does whatever God has asked of him, even if doing something is uncomfortable. Like I think about it this way. If it were Peter, like if Peter was, was on this desert road and God said, I want you to go talk to that guy. Peter would have been like, Lord, are you, are you sure? Like, you, he's a eunuch. Or, or if I was on the side of the road, like, I'd have been like, Lord, are you sure? Like, I, 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 don't, I don't know. Like, he's got a lot of people around him. And, and I would kind of wait until he got too far away and be like, now I got to chase him down and I'm in sandals. Like, oh, I can't do that. But Philip just does this with this relentless yes. And, and he knows Leviticus. He knows Deuteronomy and that he still walks obediently into this culture and religious clash. And, and what's so cool is that when you read this and see Philip again, he's plugged into the spirit of God. He finds himself in a situation that is completely orchestrated by God because what we see is almost too good to be true, right? As he approaches, Luke says that Philip hears this outcast reading from his favorite book, right? And, and just, just think about that as you're walking up if you're in Philip's shoes, as you're walking up and you have all these thoughts going through your head, right? I'd be like, you know, this guy's a royal official and I'm going to interrupt him. He's reading, you know, he's got his army of men around him. You know, we're on the desert road in the middle of nowhere. I'm by myself. I'm like, okay. So he's, you know, walking up and, and then he hears the words of Isaiah and he recognizes them and he's like, oh, oh all right. Like you could almost feel the pressure start to lift off his shoulders, and so now there's this connection point, right? He has this connection with this person. Like, think about the last time that you were at like a sporting event or you watched, you know, a, a game with, with your family or friends at your house. You know, when your team does something good, like when the Niners do something great, right? We, <laughs> thank you. We're all gonna be Niners fans. It's gonna happen. I'm gonna wear you guys down. It's gonna be great. Uh, but when your team does something great, Okay, uh, what, what does everybody do? Like everybody like gives themselves high fives and you know, high fives around the room and you can see this in stands, right? People will stand up and cheer and then they give each other hugs and like they have this connection. We live for shared experiences. We like to find commonalities between other people. They help us form bonds with other people which in turn creates opportunities for interaction and conversation and, and that's how we're designed, right? We're designed as social creatures. And so this is what God was orchestrating. This is what he was leading Philip towards. I don't know why there was all this secrecy, um, but you know, that's besides the point. God does what he does. And so Philip runs up to this guy and he has this connection point. And because he's plugged in, he knows exactly what to say. And he asks, hey, do you know what you're reading? And look at the response of the Ethiopian. He's like, no, I don't. I need someone to help me. And not only does he welcome instruction, but, but he invites him to come up and sit with him in the convoy. And, then, and this is why I, I think we can say in confidence in, in our notes, Simon is prideful, but the Ethiopian is humble. Like this is a very humble man. The Ethiopian is searching for answers. And so even when this nobody of an Israelite comes up to him, he's humble enough 
to receive it and to listen to him. You know, he doesn't say like, who are you to talk to me? Like, do you even know who I am? He says, hey, if you can help me, I'd welcome it. And, and contrast that again with Simon the magician. The Bible says he considered himself to be someone great. He wasn't humble in the least. Even after he believed and he was baptized, like how did he respond? Like remember, he assumed this position of authority and he, he sees the power of God and he's like, you know what, I want that, how much? Let me buy that. And Peter and John are like, dude, like you just joined the team and now you're asking to coach it? Like what's going on, man? Like he has no humility. And so Philip and the eunuch are riding together and they're reading the scriptures together. And wouldn't you know it, as a sign of God's providence, again, he's orchestrating this whole thing. Look at what they're reading. All right, this is Isaiah 53, one of the clearest prophecies of Jesus in the Old Testament. Verse 32. Now the passage of scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter. And like a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. And the eunuch said to Philip, about whom I ask you, does the prophet say this? About himself or someone else? Now, I think this is a great question. If there was a midpoint back then, I would hope that somebody would send that in. Um, but he asked, you know, is this sheep that is led to the slaughter, the lamb who is silent before his oppressors, who is humiliated and denied justice, the guy who is taken before a generational lineage could be established, which is that part who can describe his generation, which, side note, do you guys see that connection there? Like the eunuch has no opportunity to have a generation. Like his generation is abolished. This man could have no kids. And so that might have resonated with him a little bit differently than anybody else. And, and so he's reading this and he goes, who is this guy? Is Isaiah saying this of himself or, or is there another person that this applies to? Verse 35, then Philip opened his mouth and beginning with the scriptures, he told him the good news about Jesus. So Philip is, is again, plugged into the Holy Spirit, knows just what to say. And he immediately walks him through the scriptures showing how every passage, every book, every prophet is pointing to Jesus as the Messiah. Like God teed him up for that and, and he just knocked it out of the park. And all of this is starting to make sense to the eunuch because again, he's, he's been searching, right? This is what he's doing. He's looking for wisdom. He's been trying to seek out and worship the true God. And now with the scriptures illuminated, let's just, let's just keep reading, okay? Verse 36. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, see, here is some water. What prevents me from being baptized? Now, there are a few ways that we can interpret this. Uh, he could be saying something like, why shouldn't I get baptized, right? There's water right there. He was so moved by the spirit and, and by being just enveloped by God. And, and that he looked up and saw some water and he's like, let's do it. Like, let's get baptized right now. What's stopping me? That could be the case. The other, and, th and this is more along what, what I think happened I think this is an actual legitimate question for him. Like, re remember his condition. Like, he's an outsider to the Jewish nation because he was a eunuch. And since he's read the Jewish scriptures, maybe even ran into this, this chasm between him and the Israelites while he was in Jerusalem or dealing with other Israelites outside or whatever, he's experiencing this refusal for him in some way or another, and he's expecting a pushback from Philip, right? Right? And so this question that he asks is actually legitimate. Like he's like, Philip, is there anything that says I can't get baptized in the name of Jesus? Like is the fact that I am not whole, the fact that I'm mutilated physically, does that prevent me from being a follower of Jesus? Now, if I were to pick, I would probably lean to that um, interpretation. Both I think would work, uh, but I think that one seems to, to fit a little bit better in the narrative. And, and we're going to go to verse 37. It's probably not in your Bible. Uh, at least it's not in the body of your text. If you, if you have it, if you look, it might go from 36 to 38. Um, and, and it's in the footnotes in my Bible. And, and the reason for this is nothing sinister. Uh, the, the, this verse is not found in all manuscripts. Okay, some have it, but a lot of the earlier manuscripts do not. And so some translators seem to think that this might have been added later by a scribe. 
And he inserted this because of the traditional response and the requirements for baptism at that time. And, and stuff like that could bother people, right? Like they might see that, you know, this wasn't in the original manuscript. And it's like, see, you're trying to lie to me. Um, I personally think it's awesome because it shows transparency, right? I love the Bible just says it how it is. Like no one's trying to hide things from you or anything like that. If there's a discrepancy, the translators want you to know about it because they want you to do the research. They want you to know all of the issues. And so for me, it points to honesty and openness. And it proves that not only is the Bible trustworthy, but also as some of the translators. Like they're really trying to point us to Jesus. And not everyone thinks that they are, so I just wanted to throw that out there. And it's a really hard job. So I don't know if you guys know any Bible translators, but pat them on the back. Anyway, verse 37. And Philip said... If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he replied, I believe that Jesus is the son of God. And so this, this verse is very similar to what we see in other parts of scripture. You have a, a saving real faith in Jesus as the son of God, and then you get baptized as a public profession of that faith. So verse 38, and he commanded the chariot to stop. And they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. Okay, so here we have, again, similar outcomes of this story, Right? In Samaria, Simon believed and he was baptized. And on this desert road, the Ethiopian believed and he was baptized. But what's the difference, right? Well, notice in the story with Simon, Luke says that the crowds believed first and then Simon believed and was baptized. Which makes me ask, especially in light of James's sermon, well, were you doing that just because everybody else was doing it? Like you didn't want to be seen as, as different and you were, or maybe you were caught up in the emotional high of the moment, and so you just got baptized along with everybody. That, and that could be the case. But notice this Ethiopian isn't moved by the crowd. In fact, he's surrounded by his coworkers, right? He's in this convoy, and he doesn't care. He stops the convoy, and he's like, Philip, let's go get baptized right now. And so that's why in your notes, it says Simon is baptized with the crowd, but the Ethiopian, he makes this bold decision, and he's baptized against the crowd. You see, if Simon would have not believed, he would have stood out, which I think for a man like Simon is bad for business. And so he just joins in. The Ethiopian though, he purposely makes himself stand out from the crowd. Like both men profess faith, but only one person seems to have actions that validate it, right? Okay, let's keep reading. Verse 39. And when they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord carried Philip away and the eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus, and as he passed through, he preached the gospel to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. And it was at this point that everyone said, what just happened, right? Like there, there's a, a video game, a classic video game called A Legend of Zelda, right? Thank you. And, and, a lot, and, and Link, a lot of people think that you play the character Zelda. No, you play the guy Link. Um, that's the guy you play. He has the sword and the shield. Uh, he goes to rescue Princess Zelda. So just so you guys know, if you ever play that trivia or whatever, his name is Link. But later on in the game, uh, as you, you know, progress and get all the things or whatever you're supposed to do, it's not important, uh, he gets this magical flute, right? And when he plays it, you're able to go from level to level to level, like it, it transports you. And, and that's the, what, kind of the picture I had in my head as I was reading this, because he just kind of vanishes, right? He just goes up out of the water, and then poof, Philip is gone. The verbiage that Luke uses in the Greek portrays this, this as being sudden and, and quickly, like God snatches him away. He robs him. And some of you might be wondering what that looks like and, and what that means. So let me just tell you um, and explain just really quickly what's going on here. I have no idea, right? <laughs> I can't, I can't tell you what happened. I don't know. I, I believe this is true. I believe this happened. And I believe that God has the ability to transport uh, Philip 30 miles northwest, but I have no clue what that looked like. But really, we can get stuck on that. That's not the craziest part of this story, right? Think about it. The Ethiopian was with Philip in the water. Philip was the one holding him and dunking him. They both come out of that water and the Ethiopian's like, yeah, this is great. And he like does that thing where you wipe the water out of your eyes. If you have hair, that's what you do. Um, and, and he looks up and he's gone. Like this dude that was just here is gone. And the Ethiopian just goes about his day, right? There, there's no record of this guy just completely amazed that the Starship Enterprise showed up and Scotty beamed him out of there, right? 
There's no verse 39 and a half. And lo and behold, the Ethiopian wondered just where Philip had gone. Like that, it's not there. I think that's the craziest part of this story, this non-reaction to this miracle. But, but here's the thing. Th- that's actually the crux of this story. The crux is a rock climbing term, right? Typically a route has all these different holds and routes, but there's this one part of the climb that's the toughest, toughest part to get around. And so that's the crux. And when you pass it, when you go beyond it, then it seemed to be like it, it's downhill from there, right? Everything is golden. You, you can get to the end and you can enjoy the scenery or whatever. It's all worthwhile once you get past that crux. You see, his, his non-reaction to the miraculous transportation of Philip is very telling because this is the end of his story, right? Like we don't hear about the Ethiopian after this. So why did Luke end this story with the Ethiopian just going on his way, rejoicing as if nothing happened? It's because he wanted us to know that he found what he was looking for. He found Jesus. And so, so what if Philip was miraculously moved by God instantaneously through the air? However that looked, who cares? Like he got Jesus. That's what's more important. That's what he was after. That's what he needed. And so I, I wouldn't be surprised if we all get to heaven and we see him and we see this man and we're like, dude, why didn't you freak out when, when he just disappeared? And he'd be like, I, I didn't even notice. Like, I was so preoccupied with, with Jesus that nothing else mattered. Like, this is the ultimate prize. And this is exactly how it should be according to Christ himself. Matthew 13, 44 to 46 says this, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding one pearl of great value, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Now, after going through this passage, I hope we've all been able to to compare and contrast between these two men. You know, they're both outcasts of Israel. They're both prominent and, and respected people of their time and culture. Both are in desperate need of the gospel. But where Simon is a practicing sorcerer who meets Jesus, gives from what I could tell just this disingenuous profession of faith. And then he selfishly tries to buy God's power. Whereas the Ethiopian is searching for God, he finds him and then treasures him above everything else. And and, and so we know their beginnings, we know their reactions to the gospel. And so what's left? We we can really learn a lot about how their stories end. You see, in in the final part of your notes, it says, Simon lives in fear, but the Ethiopian lives in joy. The Ethiopian walks away in joy. He goes on his way rejoicing in God, praising and worshiping God for the supernatural, meeting him on a desert road in the middle of nowhere and rescued him from his sins. Okay, he ends his story in joy. But then Simon, look at verse 24. And Simon answered, pray for me to the Lord that nothing of what you've said may come upon me. That's fear. Like Simon walks away terrified by God. The Bible says perfect love casts out fear. God loves us so much and his love fills the heart of every believer that it overflows so much that we don't have room for fear anymore. Like that's, that should be the case. Sometimes we let fear creep in, but that should be the case that we're just so in love with God and God's love and his providence and, and our trust just overflows that we don't need to worry about where our next meal is coming or where we're gonna live or what's gonna happen tomorrow or who's at war with who or even where we're gonna spend eternity because we're found in the God of the universe because when he is for us, who can be against us? Our eyes are on Jesus and we have no fear. I want to leave you with two observations and applications before we leave. You see, the Bible is not joking about the whole, you know, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. One way or another, we're all going to stand before the almighty God and make an account before him. And and, and so, like I said, this sermon is called a belief that does. And, And meaning there is a belief that does save. And I think it's clear which one we're talking about. It wasn't the dead faith of Simon who merely just said he was a Christian, he looked at the part that Jesus was his Lord, but ultimately he was unchanged. 
a belief that does save mimics more of this Ethiopian's journey, right? A seeking for God, then being found by God, then moving by God's spirit to obey, and then living in complete joy in God. And so we're, we have to ask ourselves if our belief looks more like Simon or the Ethiopian. Like, are we in a posture of seeking power and prestige for ourselves? Are we... Are we seeking God's power and authority for our own cause, or are we humble and seeking after God's own heart? Are, are we scanning the scriptures to know him better and become better images of him? Are we at peace in our minds and our souls because we belong to God, or are we just anxious all of the time because we're trying to control everything or know everything and be the boss of our own lives? Do others describe us as people marked by peace and joy of Christ? Basically, what we want to ask ourselves as we study this story and as we ponder it this week, if we were in that convoy, if we were this Ethiopian, and Philip came and talked to us, would the story be the same? Or would it look more like Simon's story just now on a dusty road? Not only does you know, the, the title of this sermon, A Belief That Does, refer to a belief that does save, but also it refers to Philip. Right? As I said at the outset, and I've been saying it, Philip has this relentless attitude of, yes, Lord. God sent him to Samaria. He rose and went. God sent him to a desert road with no instructions. He rose and went. Then God whisked him away to Azotus, and he rose and went. Everywhere God asked him to be, he rose and went. He didn't stay and sit. He rose and went. We need to be risers and doers. We should all be men and women of faith that does whatever it is that God commands. Amen? All right, I want to try something, okay? Everybody with your head bowed and your eyes closed. Okay, we're going to take communion. But, but we've been, again, comparing Simon to this Ethiopian. And, and I would like to think that everybody here is, is on the Ethiopian side, right? Like we have this faith that is just producing in our hearts. But sadly, that's probably not the case. There's some in here that don't know God. Like they've just merely professed this faith. But there's no fruit from it. As we said, they have a dead faith. And right now is an opportunity for you, with your head bowed and your eyes closed, right now you can just change that. If you have not given your life fully to Jesus, if you've just merely been playing the part why not right now give your life to Jesus? If, if God is pulling at your heartstrings right now, turn to God. And you can do that right here, right now. It, it, there's no magic formula. There's nothing you need to say except, Jesus, you are my Lord. I give you everything. I belong to you and you belong to me. Change me. I'm going to give you an opportunity just right now, just in the quietness of your heart. Like I said, we have the opportunity in a, in a couple weeks to be baptized. You can open your eyes now. We have an opportunity to be baptized as, as a, a, or do a baptism service as a church. And we do that once a year, and, and we believe that you'd be baptized once, right? That, that, that is a one-time thing. But another sacrament that we can do as a church, which kind of says the same thing, is, is communion. And, and if you, for the first time, have, have joined the family of God, welcome. We're glad you're here. Get a cup. Let's share this meal together. For us who, who are believers who didn't need to say that prayer again because we listened to Midpoint. We know that once saved, always saved. Like we are safely and securely in the hands of God. We have that blessed assurance. We can take this communion cup and we can, we can give glory and honor to God because of what he's done. And so I want to invite you to take your, your cups out. I'm going to read the words of Paul. Just so great that we're reading through Acts, right? Because... 
Again, Paul, Paul was that. Paul was Simon. And, and then look at Paul now. In glory with God. Look at what God did. Anyway, I, I already preached a sermon. These are the words of Paul, 1 Corinthians 11. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. And it's for me, it's for all of us. No matter where you are, no matter what you've done, no matter what your skin color looks like, no matter what, the gospel is for you. Jesus can save you. And if Jesus has saved you, Do this in remembrance of him. Let's eat together. In the same way, also he took the cup after supper saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink in remembrance of me. Let's drink. All right, let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for what what you're doing. God, I praise you for the people who have given their lives to you, whether that's today or 50 years ago. God, you are so good. We love you and we worship you. Thank you for this example in scripture. God, this reminder that our faith should have legs. That a true faith motivates us not to please you, but in gratitude and in worship of what you've already done. God, may our lives model this Ethiopian. As as people outside, people seen as outsiders for whatever reason, there are many reasons that the devil lies to us and tells us that we don't deserve God's grace or God's glory. There are many lies that Satan tells us to believe God, your word is true. Thank you for this reminder, this tangible reminder of communion that we can partake and have fellowship with your son. God, and stand before you confident in the the work of Christ on the cross and in the empty grave. Again, not because of what we've done, but because of your son. We thank you. We pray all that in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks so much for listening. If you would like to give to our ministry, please check out our website at lewistonocc.org. And don't forget to like, follow, and subscribe to this podcast, as well as our YouTube channel. You can also follow us on Facebook and Instagram, so you're always up to date with what's going on here at Orchards Community Church. Take care, and God bless.